Welcome everyone to What You Need to Know About an AM Lasers Personality, a webinar presented by Ophir and hosted by Photonics Media. My name is Robin Riley and I am the Photonics Media Web Editor. I would like to introduce Dick Riley, Senior Field Sales Engineer for, for Ophir US, part of MKS Instruments Light and Motion Division. Thank you, Robin. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us in Photonics Media. So I, uh, I selected a topic today to talk to you about the personality of additive manufacturing lasers. This is a, uh, a topic I've gotten some direct involvement in over the last number of years, and I've come to realize that as much as all these systems seem to be made identically, made to the same specifications, everyone has its own personality and has to be dealt with in an individual basis. Some of the topics we'll cover this morning Give you a little review of the technology, uh, some typical applications on laser personalities. Uh, I'd like to talk about the baseline power measurements that uh, are normally taken and probably most frequently measured. Power and spatial measurements, which is actually a more important aspect of uh, understanding the personality of your laser. Some examples of power measurements uh, dealing just with that aspect, which is, as I indicated is somewhat typical and commonplace. Examples of spatial measurements along with power, which is actually a more important uh, measurement tool in looking at your, your uh, instruments. Testing frequencies and trend analyses, and a summary of, of the topics for, the, for today's discussion. Uh, just a quick overview, Ophir is part of MKS. Uh, uh, MKS is a multinational organization that gets involved in all sorts of aspects, semiconductor, life health sciences, uh, and Ophir is involved in all, the, all of these. Uh, to the fullest extent. And, and additive manufacturing, just to give everyone an overview, uh, which is rather commonplace today, uh, or let's say more commonplace today than it has been, uh, it's an amazing technology where we take various types of very sophisticated powders and we make hardened steel parts out of them. Uh, and it, it's a process where we build it up from nothing, unlike taking a piece of steel that we, as we used to years ago and mill it out into a piece that was a, a functional part. So this is additive. We're starting from nothing and scratch and making it into something that is worthwhile and of a much more complex and simplified process actually overall than previous techniques. Uh, the, the type we'll talk about today is really, this is a powder bed application where we're dealing in uh, increments of powder uh, thicknesses and micron levels. Uh, Twins. Twins, are they really the same? When you look at one system over another, when you look at uh, a series of lasers all of the same model, just like we saw uh, Scott and, and Mark Kelly, uh, they, they look very similar, but NASA said they're so close we can measure one without sending them both into space. Uh, and, uh, but they each did have their individual aspects the more they got into the analysis of these two individuals which was uh, really quite phenomenal as much as they did act and, and operate in very identical manners. They were significantly different as they found out. And some of the measurements they were taking were not valid as a result of that. So one, the, the laser, whether you have one laser or multiple lasers, uh, it's the same issue, uniformity and consistency. Uh, this is uh, an example of an operation where multiple lasers are in a particular uh, area uh, all making the same product, all producing the same kind of, of uh, ultimate end uh, product for a customer. And certainly the demand has to be where everyone has to be making the same level of quality, specification, and performance. Uh, any tolerance uh, and variance between those is, is not acceptable. Uh, some of the first things we'll look at in the first stage of understanding an AM's personality is power. Power measurements are, are easy to take. They're generally the first level of knowledge that a customer will have in understanding his laser. Uh, the important aspect here in this second point is that uh, additive manufacturing lasers uh, perform their process at a variety of different power levels. It's on a 400 watt laser, for example, the entire build is not made at 400 watts. It's made at a variety of power settings depending upon the complexity of the device, the strength of the device, how the device is held within the chamber. Uh, there can be there can be portions of a build that are made at 100 watts, others made at 250, others made at 350, some made it possibly at 400, and they're all uh, part of that build parameter. So it's important to test that laser at these different power levels. 
uh, and not select one and assume that represents everything. Exposure duration of full, full, for full stabilization. Uh, the reason I say this, there's uh, uh, some new technologies out there that allow an AM laser to be tested in a matter of seconds. Um, and the point being here is that an AM laser does not operate in a single burst of energy for a few seconds. When it operates, it's on continuously. It's running for hours, minutes, maybe days. And the, the uh, uh, additive laser needs to be measured in a, in a similar kind of continuous power uh, process. Uh, and also, and probably most importantly, uh, measurements have to be taken to really understand the laser's performance before and after key builds. If we don't do that, we don't have a baseline to start from, we don't have an ending point as to where that laser performed other than the, uh, the performance of the product itself. And if the product failed, then uh, we have no baseline against how to measure that. So we need to understand from these measurements if the laser is consistent and repeatable. Process uniformity. Process uniformity is mandatory. Uh, when you think about parts of this nature, like these blades, and we don't see many of these, obviously this is on a, a 777 uh, jet, but if these blades aren't uniform, consistent, and, and all identical, we've got a problem. And, and uh, uh, this sorts all the way down to even processes where no tolerance for error in, in devices made, such as for hip replacements made by medical device manufacturers. These devices have to be made in a very uniform manner from every machine they, they produce. And there's a high demand for these kinds of devices nowadays. And uh, the tolerance uh, to a specification is absolutely critical. Uh, so uh, any, any sort of variance is uh, just not acceptable. So power measurement, first step. Um, in measuring a powder bed machine, uh, measuring above the focal point uh, is, is essential. Most power sensors do not have the power density to be able to, to absorb the power where the focal point is being targeted. So typically the power meter is located above the focal point where the power density is less. In this case, it's sitting on a stanchion where the beam coming down from the ceiling uh, of the chamber is at a much larger size, probably three to four millimeters in, in uh, diameter. Uh, exposure, two to three minutes uh, with a device that's fan cooled gives a nice stable uniform reading the actual power. Uh, much more effective than a single shot kind of measurement, which as I indicated earlier, is really not representative of the, of the performance of a powder bed laser. Tracking power is repeatab repeatability, doing it before and after. Uh, if we have those baselines, we can now know, is this laser, will this laser demonstrate any type of uh, fluctuation or volatility that we need to understand in advance. In the laser control center, uh, what this is, uh, is the point that many times uh, the control center or control uh, computer that the operator keys in these particular settings versus what the laser is performing at the work surface, such as this measurement in this image you're looking at on the right-hand side, are many times not the same. They can be off by five or 10%. And typically the control panel is a, it a, uh, shows a higher value. Um, it's, it's, it's not critical that that be absolutely the same between what the operator is asking for and what the laser uh, is delivering as it is the ratio between there. As long as that ratio is maintaining itself, let's say it's always 5% off, that's fine. But it, um, uh, it, it should be calibrated as accurately as the manufacturer allows it to be. But many times uh, setting up a calibration curve for all the power settings is, is very appropriate. Uh, for the uh, instruction of the operator. Power sensors, uh, just to talk about this briefly, sensors are, are an easy selection. They're, rate, they're simply rated on power. Uh, most uh, additive manufacturing lasers uh, operate anywhere from 100 watts to 1,000 watts. These are both fan-cooled sensors. No water is required, uh, but the fan is needed. Accuracy within uh, plus or minus 3%. Response time for full stabilization to get a good, solid, stable number, 30 seconds possibly. And uh, uh, the readout information can be a digital meter, such as what you see down below in the, uh, with the uh, digital uh, Centuri meter. It can be a direct PC interface, like on the right-hand side, or even wireless. Uh, there are techniques now where these power meters uh, uh, sensors can be 
uh, set up to uh, uh, deliver the signal directly to a PC outside the chamber without having to use any any specific cabling, which can be a nuisance and sometimes a deterrent to taking those measurements. Best case, consistent power. Um, even consistent power has problems. So this is this is a chart that I pulled together, more just representative, where we're taking power measurements over five builds and we're doing it before and we're doing it after. Uh, so uh, the 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 upper measurement across the chart is nothing more than that we're always measuring 297 watts of power. At the end of the build, it's 295. When we do it again, it's 297. So it's very repeatable, very consistent. Uh, probably not totally realistic, but uh, it, it represents the fact that we need to measure before and after each build to be sure that uh, we have the consistency in this laser. And especially if the laser begins to, de to de demonstrate any type of inconsistency that uh, uh, tells us we've got to uh, follow these measurements very closely. And then to, if there is a change to be able to find out what's causing those changes. So in this case, um, looking at where it should be versus what it probably really is, uh, this is a situation where we took a, a, we were taking measurements, this actually came off a, uh, an application recently uh, investigated, where the starting value uh, of the power was actually uh, deteriorating from 297, it went up to 98, 296, 295, 294. Uh, this was over a period of about uh, eight hours, uh, and even the ending uh, power output was deteriorating as well. Um, and uh, it was not known at this point. Now, the important aspect here is that most of the readings were within tolerance, but we're picking up a trend here that if continued, we're gonna make product that's unacceptable. So we had, a, a in, in this case, uh, the start time, the start power rather, was dropping by about 1%. Uh, the ending was dropping as much as 2% uh, over time. So uh, as I indicated, allowed to proceed uh, over time, then we're gonna have product that uh, uh, quality control is not gonna accept. So detect, the issue here is detect the change before you make defects. Trend analysis, 1% drop in the starting power, 2% drop uh, after the build. Uh, the AM, AM uh, machine spec is plus or minus 3%, so we're still there. But if left uh, undetected, we got a problem on our hands and uh, we will make defects. The important aspect of this particular approach, uh, on power alone anyway, is that uh, this technology, this approach, whether it uses some of the equipment I've dis, uh, discussed or demonstrated above or others, is the fact that uh, you can track the health and well being of that laser uh, before the process actually produces defects. And defects are expensive, especially in powder bed applications where the build may take hours, in some cases, days to build. And the last thing you need to know is at the end of that build is that process was defective. And uh, uh, that is inexcusable. Um, one or more power, uh, multiple lasers, uh, power measurements on all the lasers, power checks uh, at all production settings, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, conduct the measurements before and after, as we stated. Uh, AM lasers, the important part with this statement here is uh, added to manufacturing lasers, or you could say all lasers, power deteriorates. It's, it's, it's absolute. It's going to happen uh, for a variety of reasons. Power supply, optics, cover glass. When lasers fail, they lose power. Uh, so we need to track the measurements. We need to track it over time. We need to track it from laser to laser. And we need to understand what within that laser is causing these failures or these, this deterioration to occur. And the closer we get to understanding that personality of that laser, the more we can avoid the laser and maintain it within its tolerance. <clears throat> so correct it before we make defects. So going back to this chart, so uh, power measurement's only half the story. Consistent power measurement, we said, that's what we want. Same starting power, same ending power, without a question, that's desirable. Uh, repeatable, uniform, predictable, fluctuations, you know, 0.6%. Uh, that's, that's what we want in this case. Uh, but power is only, one side of the measurement and and it really needs to be coupled with spatial information what does the beam look like and and, and without looking at both we're really only treating <clears throat> excuse me half the problem and we're leaving out a key measurement value on the performance and personality of that laser we can understand what the focal point shape is its size and its intensity this is the point of the beam that actually performs the work 
with the powder and the build of that particular device. Uh, power density. Power density is the size of that beam at the focal point uh, relative to power. So a, a certain beam size is going to have a certain amount of power to it, and it's going to have a certain amount of power density. And that, that's, uh, and that power density is a key factor of the powder being used in that particular build. If we don't have the right power density, uh, it, uh, the grain structure of that uh, build will not be achieved. So power density is, is critical. Power density produces the proper grain, grain structure within the build and the strength of that device. And without that, uh, power alone is not, will not get us there. So we need spatial and we need power uh, 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 to be fully, without spatial and power, power is inadequate, excuse me. So spatial, spatial measurement tools. Typical AM uh, uh, spatial and power measurement tools uh, there's a couple here that I'll, I'll mention. Uh, this is, these are both uh, devices that will measure uh, the focal point and the power within an additive manufacturing laser. Uh, Non-contact spatial measurement. Uh, this is a device that uh, actually looks at the uh, Rayleigh scatter of the beam itself, uh, does not contact the beam at all, uh, but we actually measure the, uh, the side of the beam. We measure where the focal point is located, uh, the, the size and width of that beam. And we can also pick up other aspects as well. Focal point measurement, we measure the Rayleigh scatter, as I mentioned, the size and shape and its intensity. We measure focal shift because in most of these lasers, uh, as the uh, beam is turned on, the uh, uh, beam actually gets larger uh, because of focal shift or, or optic uh, thermal uh, lensing issues, possibly. Uh, we measure power and we measure power density. Focal spot location is also a factor of this device, and, and we also capture an M-squared value of the beam. So there's a variety of, of key measurements that devices of this nature can provide in, in giving us the health and well-being and the personality specifically of, of every laser. Uh, another device is a, a device called a beam check. Uh, this uh, looks primarily at the focal spot at the build plane itself, uh, size, shape, and intensity again. Uh, power and power density. Uh, if this is a contact device where the beam actually is split off uh, through a beam splitter into a CCD camera. A uh, very traditional approach with a uh, uh, large device on the right end being the, the right side of that device being a uh, 400 watt uh, power meter and beam dump. So it's a quick, easy method to take those kinds of measurements uh, to be able to, again, capture this data on the, uh, on the uh, either one or multiple lasers. So uh, spatial image, this is a, uh, a graphical uh, design of a perfect beam. Uh, it's a 63 micron spot size. Uh, the ellipsicity or roundness is uh, 0.99, 100% is perfect. So this is where we wanna be uh, if we can ever get to this point. So uh, this is our objective, this is our plan. Uh, we want it to be uniform, we want it to be consistent, we want it to be circular, no irregularities, no anomalies. Um, and, and we can do and we can measure our beam uh, to these particular standards uh, with both of these devices. Uh, we can also find out a tip uh, if the beam is, uh, is a, uh, has a tight Gaussian design to it or a top hat fit as well. So uh, getting inside that chamber, understanding what this beam look like, looks like is, is essential. So the reality is laser to laser, lasers change. This is an example of looking at a 400 watt, a 500 watt, and a 600 watt beam, um, and what happens to that. Here's a case of, if you look at the drawing, <clears throat> we have a beam that's about 96 uh, microns. Uh, it's 90, 96 by 91 microns. Uh, the ellipsicity is about 94%. So it's, uh, we like to see this at 95% at, uh, or above, so 94.6 is, is uh, not bad. Uh, you can see from the uh, uh, crosshairs uh, the orientation of the uh, oval design. Uh, so when this beam is, is performing in a 360 degree pattern, it's gonna be a little bit wider in one direction than it is in another, which is a, can be a severe issue uh, depending upon the severity. So the beam's not circular as I indicated. Uh, the focal spot is not exactly 100 microns. It's actually smaller than it should be. So the power density uh, of this beam is gonna be greater than expected. Uh, and it may possibly um, uh, create improper grain structure in the build because too much energy is being delivered to that focal spot. Uh, the objective is, as I indicated, should be 100, 
and the power measurement or uh, power measured earlier 400 watt is, is what we programmed into the system uh, on this one we actually measured something different later so we changed went up to 500 watts uh, here's a case where the beam has changed the beam size is now 112 microns by 102 and the and the ellipsicity has also uh, gotten more oval 90 percent down from 94. so this is a major change so if this is a process that calls for both 400 and 500 watt uh, applications to rob's program uh, we're going to have a significantly different beam performing the 500 watt uh, portion of this build versus the 400 watt so ellipsicity again as i indicated uh 494 percent down to 90 Focal spot has gone up to uh, uh, 112 by 101, and the power measurement uh, programmed at, at 500, we actually were, we're measuring 480. Uh, so looking, go one step further. Here's a 600 watt, same, same laser. Uh, we're now up to 119 microns and 108, and, uh, and uh, ellipsicity uh, looks like it's stabilized out at 90%. Uh, so we're, we're okay, it's, it's at least, uh, Ellipsicity has is uh, unchanged, uh, not a good value, but it's it's okay for the moment. The focal spot is now larger, which means it's worse. Our power density has gone down even further, a twelve percent increase in the in the focal spot size. Uh, the, the power uh, differential is greater. We've reduced from uh, six hundred down to five eighty in a separate measurement. Uh, so power drops uh, in this case, if you look over this span from four hundred to six hundred watts. Uh, uh, 1.25 uh, to 3%, 5 to 600 was up to 3.3%. Uh, focal spot uh, at 400 watts, the focal spot was uh, below the uh, desired 100 micron by 12, but at 500 watts, it was 14% bigger. At 600 watts, it was 25% bigger. So we, we had some real issues to deal with this laser and understand what, what's happening here. And ellipsicity the same way. Uh, and at the beginning, we were at uh, Four per, or six percent uh, below round, it got worse to 92, and then 9.6 at 600 watts. So we got some severe issues dealing uh, whether this is we're looking at one laser or multiple lasers that we can now quantify, and I think that's the key word. We can now quantify the uh, variances between uh, this individual laser at individual power settings versus other lasers being conducted in the same testing manner to understand are we holding to the same level of performance. And if not, we need to understand why. Um, spatial measurement options, uh, as we talked earlier about various power sensor options, there's a variety of beam diagnostic uh, equipment available. Uh, contact profiling is indicated on the bottom left, uh, works on a CCD-based design. Uh, the Rayleigh scatter, the non-contact non device, which is the second one from the left, uh, where we measure the uh, up to 1,000 watts without touching the beam. We just run it through a series of optics into, into a power meter. Uh, the the uh, the third one from the uh, uh, from the left is actually a, a kilowatt version that can go up to tens of kilowatts and do the same thing without touching the beam, and the uh, far uh, and the instrument on the far right is actually an integrated one for automated manufacturing operations where uh, we actually tie it into a water cooled sensor and then output the information into uh, a database and information system at the facility. So. Focal point uh, measurements down to 50 microns, focal shift and tracking location, uh, again, within micron uh, capability measurements. So the personality, personality of each laser, uh, um, as much as they're all made the same, each laser does have its own measurements. Uh, each, each laser will track slightly differently and uh, easily tested for power and spatial measurements. These are critical. You can't do one without the other. And charting this data, Office sensor and spatial measurements is absolutely essential. Uh, some of the reasons for these changes, um, this, uh, these could be much more complex and maybe the list is longer than what I put together, but certainly uh, in a hierarchy of uh, what do you do first versus what do you do later, uh, cleanliness of the focusing uh, cover glass is generally the first uh, item to be considered. Uh, over a long build, this cover glass is gonna get dusty that restricts the power, uh, diffuses the beam, enlarges the focal spot, reduces the energy density on the beam, and you have a compounding effect on the performance of that laser. So maintaining the cleanliness of the uh, focusing cover glass in the ceiling of the chamber uh, is generally a priority on every build. 
Uh, fiber, coupling, fiber coupling maintenance is another issue that needs to be understood, uh, depending upon the frequency with which fibers may be changed or couplings may be uh, adapted. Uh, we have seen uh, uh, coupling issues where it wasn't done properly or wasn't done within specification. Uh, calibration of the laser controller. Uh, this is what I mentioned earlier, where the operator uh, keys in a particular program asking for uh, 500 watts and he's only getting 470 or 475. Or uh, it's in that uh, uh, correlating the actual power output of the laser chamber uh, at focus or above focus, whichever way is done, depending upon the instrument, needs to be correlated back to what the operator is putting into the control panel because if he thinks he's asking for 400 watts and getting less, then that's going to be a real problem in building the kind of product they're looking for. <clears throat> and, and just general pre uh, preventive maintenance uh, of all aspects of the power supply, whether it be the, the, the devices within the power supply or even the chilled water system. These are, uh, we found that uh, uh, many times systems uh, do not perform well if the chilled water is not being maintained properly to the right level, the right mixture, the right temperature, the right flow rate. Uh, uh, there's a variety of aspects in dealing with chilled water that uh, come into play that can affect the performance of the laser. So um, these are all under uh, certain controls from the manufacturer uh, or in a maintenance agreement, but uh, being smarter on how that laser performs and what to look for when the laser itself is not performing becomes all part of the learning process of the personality of that particular laser. So for critical builds, frequency of measurement, how, how often do we need to take these measurements? Uh, critical builds is a, is, a, is a subjective term, but uh, probably tied into complexity, likely tied into cost, uh, and, and should be done probably before and after each build. Uh, specifications call for uh, certain uh, certain measurements. Uh, product parts, uh, depending upon the vendor, may actually require this part of uh, documentation uh, to be provided along with the build data. Many times in some of the uh, uh, critical builds, uh, we've seen this some for the Air Force and some for the Navy, that uh, documentation on the uh, on the specification tolerance of of the performance of the laser itself have to be included with the product itself being delivered to the customer. Uh, repetitive production builds. Many times, uh, if the same uh, lasers are building the same device over and over again, uh, th this is actually where we see the situation where lasers fail most often. And it's because of complacency. Uh, we think the laser is working well, it's been making the same product day after day or hour after hour, whatever it may be, and we take it for granted. Uh, because the product looks good, we get some good results through uh, QC measurements that everything should be fine and we don't give it the attention it, it really needs to monitor that on a on a build by build basis or uh, frequently throughout the day or throughout the build process. So um, repetitive production builds probably should be done on a regular basis uh, to ensure that the laser is maintaining its stability. And as I indicated, this is, this is the one area where uh, most failures we've seen occur because of uh, complacency on the part of the uh, of the manufacturer. Um, volatile uh, additive manufacturing laser measurements. Um, uh, if if the laser is giving us peculiar readings, is not giving us stable readings uh, for whatever it, it may be, uh, performance of the power supply, performance of the of the fiber. Uh, fibers have been moved around. We've seen that in some cases where uh, devices uh, actually. And, and relocating equipment has changed the locations of some of the fibers and, and moved the fibers, fibers themselves actually affects the beam quality, surprisingly enough. But once, uh, and, and it's important to understand that if we see a laser that's volatile, it's not giving us the stability of readings, we need to understand uh, how frequent we need, frequently we need to take those kinds of measurements um, and have the confidence that the laser is, is holding within specifications. We need uh, a volatile laser may have to be measured more frequently than, than uh, one that demonstrates greater stability. And certainly new processes, powders, designs, uh, whatever it may be. We've never made that product before. We don't really understand how the units can perform making this particular product. We may be pushing the limits of the build plate itself physically and, and building uh, out to the edges. We need to understand how that, how that particular uh, laser is going to perform under these new demands. And uh, in, in this case, in this case, with a new process, a new design, new configuration, uh, frequent measurements may be uh, mandated. 
So the benefits of knowing your lasers personalities. Lasers can be highly volatile. Uh, change is common, and and it can be predicted. And and uh, these are very complex instruments with complex materials that we're dealing with. And understanding how to measure these is essential. And if we don't do that and leave that up to uh, the the laser or, or our confidence the laser is, is stable, uh, we may be asking for problems. Other lasers, some lasers are extremely stable. Uh, why some are stable and some are, are not, it's, it's hard to say. It's just the combination of equipment and how they were, were assembled. Uh, it's unpredictable. In either case, in either case, the value is this. Uh, detecting change in the laser's performance before defect products is produced is absolutely critical. And it can be done uh, with power measurement, gives us a, a good heartbeat measurement on the performance of the output of the power. The beam uh, spatial profiling information gives us a, uh, a picture into the well-being of the beam itself. And by those two, we can understand how the, how the laser is performing and the production of the quality of builds we're looking for. So uh, defects don't have to be a surprise. Um, defects can be minimized, defects in many cases by good testing of, of uh, and understanding of the personality of, of your lasers um, will help to minimize that, if not uh, eliminate it altogether. Um, so um, that's what I have today. If, if you have any questions, um, be glad to answer any that you might have. Uh, Robin, you want to take over? Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you very much, Dick. And attendees, if you have any questions, um, please enter them in the questions box uh, to the right of your screen. And uh, we'll begin here with our first question. When, when measuring ellip ellipticity, do you consider the laser's pointing stability and use the minimum exposure time on the CCD? Um, we do consider the, the stability of the beam uh, because that's actually a separate measurement uh, through these devices and measuring the, the uh, uh, centroid stability of the beam itself, So, uh, which I didn't get into in this particular discussion, but it is one of the other elements in the, in the uh, detail of, of measuring the beam's uh, ellipsicity is, is uh, because if you have a particular wobble in one direction, that will certainly dem demonstrate itself as, a, uh, as an oval beam if, if averaged over some particular time frame. Uh, but if you're also monitoring the, the location of the, of the centroid and see that moving, and we do track that uh, uh, in the same standard software, and if that's stable, then we know the beam is, is, is indeed oval. <clears throat> Good question. Okay, thank you. Uh, this question is long, so if I need to repeat it, let me know. Even though you detect that the beam shape is not correct, how can you change this fact knowing that fiber laser sources that are the most common in additive man manufacturing don't have mirrors as CO2? Then the user or the engineer who detects the failure is unable to calibrate it or fix it. And there's a second part to the question. Even though the defect on the diameter or the profile of the beam, uh, what, what can the user or engineer really do? Well, um, uh, part of that answer is that uh, you may not be able to do anything, depending upon the relationship you have with your manufacturer of that laser. Uh, what our approach has been uh, with uh, the accounts we've worked with uh, over the recent years has been uh, not necessarily to, to provide an answer as to what is actually causing that problem as much as we'd like to, is to make the, the laser engineer smart enough to understand that there's a problem. And because how that optics, how those optics are actually adjusted uh, or manipulated or adjusted in whatever manner or shape uh, some can be done through the control panel. Others may have to be done mechanically through the, the system itself are not aspects that, that uh, uh, we know of and nor would we want to recommend and, and take responsibility for because that is not our specialty. But uh, so the, our, our purpose is to make the laser engineer uh, aware that the beam is not of the size and shape it should be and to call upon the necessary resources, whether that be internal to their facility or external to their vendor, 
to actually address those issues. So, uh, uh, not the answer I'm sure you're looking for, but uh, uh, the but it's it's the best one that we can provide as an external vendor to to our customers, and making them smarter about uh, what to what to look for, and when to more importantly identify a situation that is uh, no longer acceptable, and that they need help to get that corrected. Okay, thank you. How much can a drip in operating temperature affect the beam spot? Uh, interesting question. Uh, that that's going to get driven. That's going to get driven by the the the, the uh, power density specification of the powder that's being used. Uh, different powders have a have a, have a wider tolerance of of uh, what the power density value needs to be in watts per centimeter squared uh, to perform properly, to, to put them into the proper uh, uh, grain structure needed. So it's the, the amount of drift uh, is really uh, driven by the powder itself. And we do know that different powders, different types of powders, different types of metal powders do have different uh, power density requirements for that uh, particular variant. So uh, I don't think there's one particular window that fits all because it's driven by the specification of the powder. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question here. Uh, regarding the pulse duration and pulse repetition rate, how frequently do we have to measure it? Pulse rate, surprisingly enough, is, is, not, a, it is not a variable we see changes much. Uh, with, uh, that seems to be a very stable element within the laser. Um, and, and it's, it, it's, uh, it's oversimplified. Over, I'm going to oversimplify it by, by saying it is what it is. And, and we don't, and for that reason, we don't measure it. Um, if it's set for a particular pulse rate, uh, we seem to think that is, seems to be a relatively constant value. Um, we have not seen situations where that changes. Where we do see some changes, strangely enough, is in the pulse width. Uh, as much as the, the pulse rate can stay uh, continuous and predictable, uh, we have seen uh, situations, it doesn't seem to happen often where the pulse width itself actually changes or the shape of the pulse width. And, and that, again, is something different uh, that's tied into the, the inherent design of the, of the laser itself. But uh, uh, because depending upon the pulse shaping characteristics of that particular laser, uh, whether it has a high peak to start with or a plateau or a high peak at the end of the pulse width, uh, all has to do with how it delivers energy to the focal spot. So um, pulse widths can change depending upon uh, the internal aspects of the laser itself. The pulse rate, um, I can't explain why, it doesn't seem to change that frequently. We don't see that. Okay, thank you. If my if my laser power is consistent and uniform from build to build, is there any reason my beam shape and size is not stable as well? Beam power and beam size uh, have no relationship to each other. They're, they're separate and distinct entities. Uh, you can have good power, stable, consistent, uniform, day after day, and it has no relationship to what the, what the beam shape is. And, and vice versa. You can have a perfectly round beam and the power can be all over the place. So uh, they are totally two different measurements and, and they need, because they are they operate independently and they perform independently, uh, each has to be measured independently. So uh, uh, don't, don't consider that if one is good, the other is equally as good. They, they have no relationship. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question here. If I only take power measurements on my AM laser, what is my risk? Well, there's a good chance you're going to make a product that's not going to meet specification. I, mean, I think that's 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 the first answer. Uh, I think you're leaving uh, uh, any any client is leaving themselves wide open for exposure uh, because if you're if you're not measuring the spatial side of the beam, uh, as we as you saw in some of the images. Uh, and especially if the beam becomes oval or is not delivering in the right intensity, consistency, then the, the build structure and different uh, directions of that build, especially if it's three and 360 degrees and most AM lasers are, uh, then there's a good chance 
the, the beam is going to be delivering more energy in one direction and less than another. It's going to be, have a wider beam in one direction than the other. So, yeah, yes, you're leaving your, you're leaving yourself exposed uh, significantly if you're not looking at both aspects of of that uh, uh, of not just the power but the spatial side as well. Okay, thank you. Next question here. We use burned paper, otherwise called zapped paper, to take the, deem, the beam diameter measurement. How accurate is that method? Well, uh, our opinion coming, on, coming from the instrumentation side is um, zapped paper is not, is not at all accurate. Um, it's a good alignment tool. It gives you an idea where the beam is or where it may be located. But if you think about what a beam is doing to zapping paper, it's burning it, and when something burns, it gets bigger. Uh, so, it, the, the, uh, so any any spot you see of any size or small size on the paper is larger than the beam itself, because when it burns, it rot it, it radiates out uh, in all directions. So, uh, burn paper is great for alignment purposes only, uh, and and really not an indication uh, or a tool to be used for, for any sort of measurement tool, in our opinion. Okay, thank you. AM facilities are, for the most part, in controlled environments uh, with regard to temperature and humidity. Do any of these factors impact the measurement of power or spatial characteristics of the AM laser? Um, strangely enough, this question has come up several times. And uh, as indicated, uh, a lot of these facilities are highly controlled with humidity because of the powders uh, 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 may be hydroscopic in the sense that they may absorb moisture and, they, and that, that is a situation that would be catastrophic to an additive manufacturing laser system itself. Uh, so uh, very controlled environments is important, but uh, the, uh, uh, we have not seen any, any relationship between uh, humidity control uh, environments and power or um, spatial measurements having any effect. Okay, thank you. Next question here. If a warm-up time for a laser is stated to be 15 minutes, but in reality it is more like four hours for the laser power to stabilize, would this be indicative of manufacturing fault or would it be possible for a laser to degrade like this? And if so, what would be what could be the cause? Uh, that's interesting. Um, we do know there is a, a, a heat of time or, or a, a set of time for most lasers to, to reach stabilization. Um, I can't say I've heard of one that takes takes four hours, but I, I'm sure it's uh, not unusual. Um, I think the the uh, the issue has to be. Once known, uh, unfortunately, that has to be factored into the build schedule, and uh, 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 not being a, a laser manufacturer, I, I really can't come in on what what the cause of that might be, other than the fact that there is something inherently wrong in the power supply system of that laser that requires it to have a a, a, a set of time of, of that duration. That's extremely long. Most most lasers today. Uh, have a setup time or, or a stabilization time of minutes, tens of minutes maybe, uh, at most before they're fully stable. So uh, the, the best recommendation we can offer is is to uh, consider talking to the laser manufacturer themselves and and uh, see where that is. But there's something inherently wrong inside that system that is causing that delay to occur. That that is extremely unusual and uh, uh, should be looked at. Okay, thanks. Once I have an AM laser under control and I'm getting repeatable power and spatial measurements, how frequently do I need to continue this process? This, this is this is probably uh, one of the more frequent questions we get, um, and it really comes down to what it, it's going to be based on the information you get from your measurements. If if you start out taking measurements, let's say in a particular build, and the build is uh, done in uh, let's say once a, you, you build something once a day. So we're doing a before and after on that build uh, in the morning and we do it at the end of the, at the build process. Um, as once, once you have confidence that these numbers from day to day or from build to build, whatever that frequency may be, seem to be stable and seem to be within the tolerances of, of, of that laser system, 
uh, whatever those tolerances may be. You know, and, and generally most people operate under a plus or minus three percent if they want to try to keep it tight or better. Then, and as long as that, uh, then then the process usually calls for uh, moving that second measurement to the to uh, 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 another day or a second day or a third day, and then uh, seeing how long we can go before we actually begin to see some sort of deterioration, and then we move it back. Uh, let's say we can we we move it out to two days, and then maybe three days or four days or five days or once a week. Uh, and as long as we're getting the same numbers uh, at those uh, less frequent measurements, then that's then that's fine. Uh, so it's it's really the confidence that those numbers are giving you as to the frequency with which uh, those tests are taken. And uh, um, only if you see some sort of change or deterioration would you want to shorten that time period again and go back to something more frequent. Okay. There are power measurement devices available today that can measure the high power of a laser within seconds. How accurate is this approach? Well, um, I mentioned this earlier in the presentation. Uh, there are some of the, these new devices that measure power uh, 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 within seconds, five, 10 seconds, something of that nature. Um, interesting idea, uh, uh, quick, easy, fast, uh, but it's not how a laser performs, in my opinion. A uh, laser does not, an AM laser does not perform or has to be uh, uh, turned on and performed for a matter of five or 10 seconds. It's turned on in a continuous mode for some period of time. Uh, these devices that measure within a matter of seconds, uh, it's actually a calculated value, whereas a standard thermal sensor is measuring uh, uh, power over time, and we actually can get a stability measurement both uh, graphically and digitally as to uh, how that power is, is uh, performing over a period of time, 30 seconds, uh, minutes, several minutes if necessary, uh, to ensure that the laser is, is fully operational, fully performing under full uh, typical uh, operations. And uh, it's our opinion that uh, that's a more accurate measurement rather than a calculated value of the uh, 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 power output of that laser, because that's how the laser's operating. So our opinion is measure it in the same way in which the laser's operating. I would like to thank Ophir, and I would like to thank our presenter, Dick Riley, presented by Ophir and hosted by Photonics Media. Thank you.